quickly what? What's she gonna do? Does it? That's why you're two minutes early. Good morning. Let's all stand. Light of the world, light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see, beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, King of all days, it's so, so highly Exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became more. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that. You're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy, all together wonderful to You're all together lovely. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Thank you, Father. You know, Lord, as I got a little time away uh, on Thursday night just to spend with you, 
And I don't know how it is, but it seems that every time I'm just spending a bulk of time in prayer, that my mind always goes to the grace of God. It's unimaginable. The depth of your grace, of your mercy, of your kindness, of your forgiveness, of your love toward us, Lord. You know, it can't be measured. And Lord, may we never take that for granted. May we always be ever so appreciative and thankful, Father, that you saved us, Lord, apart from anything that we could bring to the table or offer to you, Lord. Christ alone saved us. Christ alone maintains that salvation in us through the work of the Spirit. And so this morning, Lord, as we gather, and we want to pray for the many uh, that are away celebrating Father's Day, give them safe passage to wherever they're going and home again. But for us who are gathered here this morning, Lord, we just want to tell you, our Father, on this Father's Day, how thankful we are for you sending your Son to die for our sins, that we might be brought back into a wonderful relationship with you, Lord. May our worship express that this morning as you've given us this opportunity to do that. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask, and all God's sons and daughters would say, amen. Hey, let's remain standing. we're not talking physically, Lord. We're talking, Lord, experientially. Like Moses, who desired to just see you once. Lord, we just love your presence. We love your presence amongst us. And your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. So, Lord, be our guest. Be here with us. May your spirit move amongst us and minister to our hearts, to our needs. Prepare us for all that you have in your word. 
that we would know you more when we leave than when we came. We pray this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I know you can do all things. You have been faithful and true. You are my mighty God and King. I will not fear what man can. trust in you. I will trust in you. This life is no longer mine. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I know you can do all things. I know you can do all things. have been faithful and true. You are my mighty God and King. I will not fear what man can do. When no fruit is on the vine, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. This life is no longer mine. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. When no fruit is on the vine. When no fruit is on the vine, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. This life is no longer mine. I will trust in you. 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 Lord, we've had so, there are so many moments in our lives where we don't know what you're doing. Sometimes we even wonder where you're at. Where we don't see that fruit. We don't see anything. But Lord, we need to learn to trust and walk by faith, not by sight. And so we pray you'd grow us in our faith this morning. Grow us in our faith, Lord, so that no matter how dire a situation looks, like Job, we have that resolve. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Grow us, Lord, in these things.
grace abounds. The grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Your feet may fail and fear surrounds me. Never fail and you won't start. call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves where oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours you are my spirit lead me spirit lead me where my Walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead. Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name. So will rest in your embrace. For I am yours. You are mine. I will call. I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. My soul will rest.
us a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. sand we don't want to have depression and a crumbling in our lives Lord we want to have faith in you because we know Lord every morning your mercies are new where sin abounds grace much more abounds though we might be faithless you are faithful it's all about you Lord Jesus and we worship you with all of our hearts. Let's all stand. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved Great. 
God, my Savior, you ransomed me. And like a flood, your mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised. The Lord has promised good. Father, the unsearchable riches of your grace. Beyond comprehension. Unimaginable. What it is you have done for us, Lord. You know, 43 years of serving you, Lord, and spending hours upon hours just trying to wrap my hands around the depths of your grace. And it is an ocean that's too deep. It's too wide. It's too incomprehensible that you would send your son to die for us. Who can wrap their hands around that? The love of God toward vile, wicked sinners that you, Lord, would take our place, bear our punishment, shed your blood that we could be forever forgiven and brought back into just intimate relationship with the Father. 
Lord, I thank you that you are my Father. Lord, I thank you for all of the wonderful as we're going to celebrate this morning, earthly fathers, but there's no one who compares to you. You have been steadfast. You have been faithful. You have been a sure and ever-present help. You've been an encouragement. You've been a protection. You've been a provider. You've been a source of wisdom. And Lord, you've been a source of discipline. But in all of those things, Father, we thank you this morning. And Lord, we pray for every need in this fellowship, physical, financial, emotional, spiritual. Lord, you know them before we even ask. We just lift those things before you this morning and we ask that you take care of them. And Lord, we pray for the many of our fellowship that are with their fathers and with their families. Bless them, Lord. Bless Gary and Gail as they're up in Tahoe this weekend celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. The second one we've had in the last year here, uh, unimaginable, Lord. That just, uh, that just doesn't happen in this society anymore. We pray that you just bless them, Lord. And so, Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would just settle in upon us this morning and help us to comprehend with all the saints the depth, the width, the height, and the breadth of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, Amen. We'll spend a few moments, if you will, fellowship with one another before you find your spot. All right, if you guys can find your places, we'll get moving. All right, if you guys can come on in, find your spot.
All right. No. All right. Okay. Hey, listen, we got a, several announcements, so if you guys will settle in your spots this morning, we'll get moving. Don't make me ring the bell. Okay, that's it. I'm ringing it. Wow. That bell has authority. Uh, hey, I want to wish Gene Howerton... A happy 90th birthday. You know, Gene, uh, when I first moved up here and I had my heating and air business, uh, I did a lot of work for Gene's company. And I was just impressed at what a skilled carpenter he was. And then I found out um, that he'd helped build Noah's Ark. And so uh, <laughs> that's where he got his skill set. So, you know... We wish you a happy birthday, brother. Um, next week, uh, Gary and Gail celebrated their 50th anniversary. This is the second couple we've had in our fellowship in the last year that has celebrated 50 years. And uh, yeah, they're, they're not here. They're up at Tahoe. But we had a wonderful time down at Kim Weiss. Weiss is, uh, she has a little um, wedding chapel down in Rough and Ready. And so we just had a wonderful time renewing their vows yesterday. And then they headed up. So be praying for them. It was just a great time. And if you want to renew your vows, we'll, listen, book that wedding chapel. It is a gorgeous old place with a great history. And uh, then we can renew your vows and rough and ready. Because <laughs> marriage can be rough if you're not ready. So um, VBS coming up quickly, July the 13th through the 14th, ages 4 to 10. And uh, you need to pre-register. If you have any questions about VBS, see Kyle. My wife, she was sitting there. I think she's in the Sunday school ministry. So see her. Hey, be praying for Susan Stubblefield this morning. She's um, not feeling well. I think it's headache, fever, something like that. But we need to pray for Susan. She's really been struggling physically here lately. And secondly, let's pray for Debbie Elder this morning. If you can remember to do that this week, the cancer came back. Um, she's having treatments. You know, she has a young daughter and she's a single mom. And the prognosis isn't good. If the Lord doesn't intervene and heal her like he did before, she was completely healed for five years. And so um, we just want to continue to hold her in prayer. Hey, July the 3rd, how many, now I know this is going to be a funny question, how many remember the band Metallica? Probably not many of you, do you? More than I thought. Well, how many... <laughs> The bass player, how many remember the bass player that was killed tragically in, I think, Switzerland when a bus rolled over? His sister lives here in Grass Valley, and she's a believer, actually North San Juan, and Simon Woodstock, one of the instructors down at the Bible College in Marietta, came up and interviewed her and did a documentary with her. And so this thing has already gone like ballistic, thousands and thousands of hits, the first place that he's going to show that documentary is here on Tuesday, July the 3rd. And so what we want to do is invite you guys to be here to support it. And I know that there's going to be people here that probably, you know, are a little different than you. But that's okay. They need salvation. The whole thing is an outreach. We're going to have, uh, you know, some pork pool sandwiches and some other things here. Um, so uh, please be in prayer about that. Uh, Simon's wife, Amina, we've known her from Africa. He married a gal from the Fort Portal area. And he teaches apologetics down at the Bible College. But we're going to be having this outreach where we have this documentary. I think it's about an hour and a half long. And, and just notice and be in prayerful care because the first part of it really is talking about her brother. And so, and it kind of moves into a very evangelistic message toward the end. But we're going to use this as an outreach to our community because I guarantee you there are a lot of young people or middle-aged people that remember Metallica. I got saved and missed 
I'm so glad I missed Metallica and disco, especially <laughs> disco. I was already saved when all that was going on, so I, man, I missed all of that, you know, John Travolta and, I, you know, I, I listen, Keith Green and those guys were the guys I were listening to, but um, I stopped with Bread and Journey and, and then got saved, <laughs> and so... Creighton's Clearwater Revival, that's what I was listening to before I got saved. But, but we're going to use this as an outreach, so please be praying about it and that we might reach that generation. Metallica, I guess, was a very big band, very popular. In fact, it's, there's a resurgence about that going on right now. And so Connie, like I said, the bass player's sister is um, going to be with us too, and she, you can talk to her about uh, her conversion as well. So, Hey, let's turn our Bibles, Acts chapter 15. We've come as far as uh, verse 35, and so we'll pick up there in verse 36 this morning. Very interesting thing before us this morning, and um, how many have had personal conflict with people in the faith? Just a few of you. Well, we're going to look at that this morning in the life of Paul and Barnabas, so uh, let's pray, and we'll dive right in. Father, we thank you so much for your word. So excited to be here and so excited to see as we're walking our way through uh, just the acts of the apostle, the record of the early church and the inner workings of it, uh, to see, Lord, that they had problems just like we have problems. Uh, They weren't immune from those things. Uh, But, Lord, there's always an answer for that stuff. And so, Lord, as we look at this this morning, Father, just speak to our hearts. Just, again, minister, Father, uh, to our spirits through your word. We ask in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen. Some of your fathers are wondering, how come we didn't get honored like the mothers did? We're going to do it at the end of the service. So, hey, as we're walking our way through the book of Acts, we came to chapter 15 which, by the way, follow chapter 14, and it always does. It kind of works out that way, doesn't it? (laughs) But chapter 14, moving from chapter 13 into chapter 14, we have the first recorded missionary journey. We have the first recorded missionary journey inspired and initiated of the Holy Spirit. And as we looked at chapter 13 and chapter 14, we saw that it wasn't without difficulty. We saw there that they traveled 1,600 miles, 400 by sea, 1,200 by land. And they encountered spiritual warfare. They encountered physical difficulty. Paul contracted malaria there in the region of Pamphylia, and that's why they went to the high ground up to Antioch Presidia. There there was persecution. We saw that he was kicked out of the city of Antioch and then fled Iconium as well and was stoned to death in Lystra. God raised him from the dead. We saw there that John Mark had actually abandoned them when they came to the regions of Pamphylia. So we saw there on that missionary endeavor the absolute difficulty of reaching the world with the gospel, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. All of those things uh, Paul endured. And that's why, as we said last week, Paul was able to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, be ye steadfast, always uh, uh, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. And there has to be some stick to this about us, some steadfastness in us, amen? Concerning the things of the Lord. And as we moved into the rest of chapter 15, the first 35 verses that we saw last week, we we saw that the issue was settled on how we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves; it's a gift of God. And so when we come to verse 36, watch this, because sometimes we have this romantic view. I don't know how you are, but sometimes I can, as I'm thinking about the early church, have this romantic view. Oh, that we could be like the first century church with all the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the gospel, thousands upon thousands getting saved. Oh, Lord, if we could only go back to those days. Now, listen, uh, they had struggles too in those days. We read here in verse 36, and some days after Paul Uh, Some days after they'd been now in Antioch, pastoring the church there, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. 
Now William Barclay tells us it's been about five years. So Paul and Barnabas had finished that first missionary journey, had reported back to the church at Antioch, had gone up to Jerusalem and settled this issue on how you're saved in chapter 15, had returned to the church, and for about five years they've been there preaching and teaching the Word, encouraging the church there in Antioch. And no doubt the Holy Spirit is moving on the heart of Paul because he has the pastor's heart. Hey, let's go back and see how they're doing. Let's just don't give birth to things, but let's make sure that those things we give birth to continue to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. So uh, they determined now to go back and visit those towns and those cities, those churches that they had planted on their first missionary journey. And verse 37 says, And Barnabas determined. Uh, The indication uh, in the Greek language is, is that he had set his heart and mind to this. And he was unbendable about it. He had determined to take with them John, whose surname is Mark, John Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. The one who left them, kind of freaked out and abandoned them there on the regions of Pamphylia on their first missionary journey. But verse 38 says, as they're having this discussion, uh, that Paul thought it not good to take him with them who departed from them. Uh, A polite way of saying who wimped out, who left us, you know, in the field and went home, who departed from us uh, when we were there in Pamphylia and went not to the work. Circle the word work. And verse 39 says, and a contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. You remember he had owned property on Cyprus. He had sold it in the early days of the church to help support the church as people were staying there after the, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He kind of returns home with Mark. We don't see much more about Barnabas after this because Luke will follow the ministry of Paul. It doesn't mean that Barnabas didn't have a very successful ministry. We do know, as we're going to see this morning, that several times in the New Testament, Mark is mentioned again in a very favorable way. And the indication is is that there was some resolve over this conflict. But at this moment, this contention arises so sharply between the two of them that they part company. This is amazing to me. Because Barnabas was the one who went and took Paul and introduced him to the apostles when they didn't want anything to do with him. Barnabas was the one when he was sent out by the leaders in the church of Jerusalem to go as far as Antioch and plant the church there that as the church began to grow, went and sought Paul there in Tarshish and brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year together, they co-labored in, in ministering to this church. It was Paul and Barnabas as those elders were meeting there and praying about the ministry in Antioch that the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to. And they were sent on the missionary journey. They spent 53 days together in the foxhole through difficult times and through difficult situations preaching the gospel and seeing what God was doing there in that region. And now for the last five years, they have been co-laboring together with other prophets and teachers there in the church of Antioch. So no doubt there was a very intimate relationship between these two men. Have you ever had friendships like that where You've been a co-laborer. There's been this real bonding and real intimacy between you and somebody else. And all of a sudden, something gets in there and, and, and drives a wedge. You know, this difficulty was so great. This contention was so deep. Uh, maybe words were said that shouldn't have been said. No doubt there's pride on both parts because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, only by pride comes contention. And so something is cooking here, something uh, stirring here. This contention is so sharp and is so great uh, that they divide asunder. And we see now that Barnabas will take Mark, 
and he'll sell to Cyprus, and Paul will choose Silas. Remember, Silas came down from Jerusalem. He kind of stuck around there uh, as the other person bringing the letter from the church at Jerusalem to Antioch went back home, and he departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. So we have this split in leadership this dividing of these two men who once were so tight and so close. And and the old age old question has been for years, who was right and who was wrong? I mean, when you read through that, you, you ask yourself that question, who was right and who was wrong? And does the scriptures bear it out? Well, let me give you this. Get your pad and pen out. There's some things we want to look at this morning about this situation. Um, Because once we get done, you're going to find out that we don't really have a romantic view. Listen, the early church struggled with things, the same things we struggle with today. You know, with just the difficulty of ministry. As we saw in the earlier chapters, and now as we come to the end of chapter 15, this division. You know, the Bible tells us, and listen carefully to me this morning, we are to live in peace with all men as much as it lies within us to do that. And sometimes uh, because of whatever is going on, whatever the situation is, we can't live in peace with other people because they don't want to live in peace. They don't want to get to the heart of the issue and solve the matter. They just want to be angry or they just want to be upset. I think in this case there was a vast difference of a worldview on ministry. And I think that's what separated them. So I would say to you that they're both right and they're both wrong. And I'll prove that point uh, this morning. They're both right because both of them had a worldview of ministry that was correct. Paul, as we're going to see, if he was standing here with us this morning, we would understand that he's probably a type A personality. If you were to have a dictionary in the first century and you looked up a type A personality, it would probably be a picture of Paul. Uh, Very driven, uh, very task-oriented, very goal-oriented, very loyal, very faithful, very dedicated. Probably would be like a bulldog that when he latches his teeth into something, he just doesn't let go. And you would need a man of that character, you would need a man that tenacious to be the man that would keep the gospel of Christ, the grace of God, from becoming another sect of Judaism. And it would have become had it not been for the Apostle Paul. We saw that in the last chapter when he went up, when there was no small small dissension with those guys to challenge the leaders and say, listen, salvation is by Christ and Christ alone through His grace. It's not by being circumcised or keeping the law of Moses. And had it not been for, for Paul, that might have slid into another sect of Judaism and this great gospel of grace would have been lost. So God has to choose a man, a man that is so focused, a man that is so dedicated A man has such a sense of loyalty and finishing the course that has been set before him that he's immovable, unbendable, uncompromisingly so. But those kind of guys are difficult to live with. You know, he tells Peter at one point, you're a re-blowing in the wind, you're a re-blowing in the wind. This is Peter. You know, you, you, you come down here and you eat pork chops with the rest of us here in Antioch, but when the elders come from Jerusalem, you separate yourself as though, you know, what you're doing was wrong. You hypocrite. I mean, he called him out in front of everybody. Paul would have been a hard guy to be around because he had such a very narrow view of truth. And man, listen, there were no fringe areas for him. There was no gray area for him, man. It was right or it was wrong. And if you were wrong, he would call you out on it. But Barnabas is a people person. Not a work-oriented person, as we're going to see this morning, like Paul was, but he was a people person. First time we find Barnabas in the Scripture, he's selling some of his property on Cyprus, he's giving it to support people who need to stay in Jerusalem after the Passover, after the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, just to kind of get confirmed in the faith. Then we find him encouraging Paul and bringing Paul to the rest of the disciples. And then we find him, again, as we said, going in searching for Paul 11 years later to bring him to Antioch. He is a people person. And no doubt Barnabas sees something in John Mark 
And what he sees in John Mark is true because later John Mark will write the gospel of Mark. Later we're going to see in our study this morning that Paul has great things to say about John Mark because Barnabas did not give up on this young man in his failure. So you have Barnabas, a people person, a person who doesn't give up on people, that goes to the nth degree, even in their failures to restore, and then you have Paul that's so focused on the work. Well, let's take a look at that this morning. We go back to Acts chapter 9, verse 15. You remember when Paul was on his way to Damascus with letters of threatening in his hands to arrest Christians? And there he has an encounter with the Lord. And the Lord knocks him from his high donkey. And the Lord says to to Saul of Tarsus at that moment, who will become Paul the apostle, hey, isn't it hard to kick against the ghosts? Isn't it hard to resist the Holy Spirit? (laughs) Who are you? I'm the Lord Jesus Christ whom you're persecuting. And then Paul says, what do you want me to do? That's a type A personality. I must do something in response to this, what do you want me to do, Lord? And uh, he said, go on to Damascus and it will be shown you. Remember when he says to Ananias there, go meet this guy. You know, he's down on the main road in Damascus. He's blind. And show him, I'm, I'm going to tell you what you need to tell him, the things he's going to suffer. And we read there, and the Lord said unto him, go your way. But Ananias is going to argue. He says, listen, uh, you, do you know who this guy is? Uh, this guy is, he came here to persecute us. And, and now you want me to go pray for him? And notice what the Lord said. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. And oh, how Paul completed that task. 120 times in the 14 epistles that he writes, over half the New Testament, he mentions grace. More than all the other apostles put together. Like I shared with you before, John, who you would think would be the apostle of grace because he mentions that he's the one that Jesus loved. He's the one who puts his head on the chest of Jesus. There was a very intimate relationship between John and Jesus. And yet John, in all of his writings, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and even the book of Revelation, he only mentions grace seven times in all of those writings. Paul is the man of grace. He understands that he's less than the least, not worthy to be called an apostle. He understands the depths of which God rescued him from that he had wasted the church, that he had murdered Christians, that he had forced those uh, that he now serves to deny the faith by the edge of the sword. And this deeply wounded Paul. And so Paul understood grace. I think that was a thorn that was in Paul's flesh. He prayed on three separate times, Lord, take this from me. And the Lord said, I'm not going to, Paul, because when you're weak, you're really strong, and my grace is sufficient for thee. I think when Paul would go to bed at night and close his eyes, he would see those Christians that he, he, he persecuted, that he... He, he caused to deny and blaspheme the faith. And so Paul understood grace in a very deep way. But having been forgiven to the degree he was, and having been loved by the Father through Jesus Christ to the depths that he was, he was a man. Because the Bible says, much forgiven, much loved. And he was committed, he was consecrated to the work now that God is calling him to. We move through to Acts chapter 13 verse 2 and it says, and as they minister in the Lord and fast and pray, we just kind of mentioned this, the Holy Spirit said, separate Paul and Barnabas unto the work. No doubt the Holy Spirit is confirming this in, in Paul's heart that there's a work to be done. There's a job uh, that needs to be performed. Uh, there's a task that needs tending. And no doubt the Lord had shown to Paul what it is that God had asked him to do. And he had set his heart wholly upon this work. Uh, There was nothing more important to Paul than finishing the course that had been set before him. That completing the task that God had given him. I mean, at this point, he's so grateful for the grace and forgiveness of God that nothing's going to get in his way in serving the Lord. I mean, he is focused. And we see that the Holy Spirit, when he said separate them, that man, when Paul was separated on this work, nothing would stop him. In fact, at the end of his life, he will write, I fought a good fight. 
I finished the course. No matter how difficult it was, and you can read 2 Corinthians. 2 Timothy is his last will and testament. The 2 Corinthians is his diary. You get to get an insight into the life of Paul like no place else. And Paul, at the end of his life, with all of his struggles, said, man, I fought a good fight. Lord, I fought a good fight for you. I finished the course. I never gave up. No matter how difficult it was, I never gave up. And I defended and kept and guarded the faith. That's Paul. That's tenacious Paul. That's uncompromising, consecrated Paul. That's focused Paul. Everything else is an aside to him other than accomplishing the task that is before him. Now notice in Acts chapter 14, we saw this a couple weeks ago, verse 26. And thence they sailed to Antioch from whence they had been uh, recommended to the grace of God. And notice the next words. For the work which they had fulfilled. Look at the difficulty Paul went through. We just looked at the first missionary journey. Look at the difficulty in travel. Look at the difficulty in spiritual warfare. Look at the difficulty in sickness and in emotions and, and in weakness. Look at the difficulty. It's stoned to death. He gets back up and goes right back through those same cities. You can't stop a guy like that. Because Paul was determined to finish the work that the Holy Spirit had commissioned him to. And he wasn't going to be stopped or dissuaded or discouraged in any way, shape, or form. He one day was going to stand before his God and say, listen, I have fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. And so when he gets back to Antioch, he's able to say, we fulfill the work that the Holy Spirit set us to do. In fact, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter, 11, uh, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he says these words. And you get a sense of the heart of Paul. You get a sense of the mind of Paul in this verse. At least I do. He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Don't you think that weighed on Paul? There was something that God committed to my trust. This glorious gospel to defend, to preach, to do this work that he's asked me to do. And then he moves on and says, and I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who hath enabled me, not only to commit it to my trust, he gave me the strength, he enabled me for that he counted me faithful. God saw something in me that maybe Paul didn't even see in himself in the beginning. But God counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And because God has done that, you can just hear the thoughts of Paul ringing out loudly saying, listen, because God was willing to entrust this to me, commit this to me, enable me to this task, listen, I'm not going to fail him. I am not going to fail him. I'm going to finish the course that's been set before me. Listen, I'm going to fulfill my ministry. I'm going to see it through to the end. Nothing's going to stop me. Nothing's going to dissuade me. And that's why he could write in 1 Corinthians, as we already mentioned, chapter 15, verse 58. Listen to what he says. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Immovable. I think Paul was. Always abounding in, what is the next three words? In the work. You see how important the work of the Lord was to Paul? In the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul was so mission-minded, so work-oriented, so wanting to please the Father and finish the thing that was entrusted and committed to him that, listen, it didn't matter who went with him. It didn't matter about personalities. It didn't matter about feelings. It didn't matter if you got, your, you know, your, 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 you got wounded around. He could care less. You know, he would be the kind of the guy who would look at you and say, get over yourself. You know, what's wrong with you? We got a job to do. We got a work to accomplish. Get up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, get moving. And if you don't want to get moving, then get gone. But we're going. Yeah, that's Paul. And I think, listen carefully, I think when it comes to ministry, that attitude is necessary 
for the men God uses. And they can't be mealy mouth. They can't be wishy-washy. They have to be men that are committed to what God has committed them to do. Uh, they have to be men that are focused, men that are consecrated and committed to the task that is before them. And sometimes so focused and so committed that relationships kind of get lost in it because the only relationship they're concerned about is the one with the Lord and finishing the course that's been set before them. And those type A personalities are hard to be around, but they're the people who get things done. And they are necessary in the kingdom of heaven. But so also is a Barnabas. Because if there were just Paul's, people would get run over the top of. And there's those Barnabases that they say, oh, no, 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 Paul. Now you hurt John Mark's feelings. Feelings. <laughs> you know, I, I think I had a feeling once about three years ago. I'm not really sure. You know, type A personalities don't have feelings. Feel, what, you know, my wife, when we first got married, used to ask me, we'd be going on a drive. She'd say, how do you feel about something? What? You know, you know, how do you feel? Feel? I never thought about feelings. Now, I can tell you what I think about it, you know, logically, scripturally, morally. I give you my biblical worldview about it, but feel. I don't know. <laughs> and isn't it good that we have wives that can teach us men how to feel? I'll tell you, every man in this church, listen, I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth this morning. If you were left to yourself, if you did not have a wife, you would have a man cave. You wouldn't have a home. I know a guy that has one. I know a couple of them. Dude, you walk into their house and, and I'll tell you, I know a guy, you walk into his house and guess what's on the kitchen table? is reloading equipment. And you can tell there's no women in that place. The, the furniture, none of it matches because they bought it at the, you know, because it's just functional. You know, it doesn't have to match. It's just functional. You can tell by the way they dress. Uh, it's just functional. And then women come into our lives and they teach us about feelings and about colors. <laughs> you know, uh, we, I did the 50th renewing of their vows ceremony for Gary and Gail yesterday and and, you know, he said, don't wear a suit, just wear slacks and a, a nice button-up shirt. And so I did. And my wife said, you look really nice. Why don't you wear that tomorrow? I said, I'll freak everybody out. <laughs> because uh, people watching will realize that this is not black and white. <laughs> you know, because, hey, I got this thing where you just go buy, you know, because someone said to me, do you only own a couple shirts? Did they pay you enough at the church to buy clothes? <laughs> and I said, listen, when I find a shirt I like, I buy six or seven of them all black and so when I find a button if it's black or dark blue I'll buy it jeans Levi's I'm built for comfort not for speed <laughs> and, uh, but I like these these are really comfortable I might start wearing some more of these I might freak you guys all out but listen <laughs> emotions and feelings and people Barnabas was all about that and Barnabas never gave up on John Mark and it's interesting that we read about John Mark in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writing. Watch what Paul writes about John Mark in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you, and Marcus. Now, we know this is John Mark's because he says, Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, it's Barnabas' nephew, touching whom you receive commandment, if he comes unto you, receive him. He's an honorable man. Paul had kicked him to the curb when he got ready to go on their second missionary journey. Barnabas picks him up and nurtures him, cares for him, attends to him, and restores him to the extent and to the degree that later even Paul will have to write to the church at Colossae because John Mark is part of the missionary team, the ministry team going to that church. He said, listen, when he comes, receive the words that he has to say. He's a very wise man. In fact, in Philemon 
there's only one chapter, so you can't hardly get lost. But Philemon chapter 1, verse 24, he mentions Marcus as well as he's part of that ministry team going uh, to minister to Philemon. He said, Marcus and Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. And listen, the only reason why he was a fellow laborer to Paul is because Barnabas picked him up when he failed. Bar- Paul would have kicked him to the curb. And then we read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. And this is probably one of the most important ones. Paul is now coming to the end of his ministry. He knows that his time of departure is at hand. He knows this time he will not be released from prison. He knows this time he will be taken out to the Appian Way and beheaded for the faith. He knows he's being poured out like a drink offering. And listen, very soon he's going to go be with the Lord. I personally believe when Paul's head rolled down into the basket, there was a smile on his face. Because early he writes, I'm between a rock and a hard place. To be here and minister to you is more needful, but I'd rather go be with the Lord. Because he had been there. And I think he's with delight looking forward to that moment of departure. But as, as he's writing Second Timothy, this is his last will and testament, he records there in verse 11 of chapter 4, only Luke is with me. He writes earlier in 2 Corinthians, he says, you know, at at my defense, nobody stood with me. He talks about Demas forsaking him, having love of the present world. And he mentions a bunch of others that had departed because of the persecution, because of the difficulty, had literally wimped out. Now this is important. These are men who'd walked with Paul through his whole ministry and came to the end of his ministry and listen very carefully to this, this point and wimped out at the end of the ministry. And Paul is there in prison in a deep, dark, damp, dank dungeon waiting for his execution. Everyone else had abandoned him. All of those people who walked with him all of those years in ministry are gone. Fled. Wimped out. Didn't continue. And Paul writes from that prison. He says, only Luke is with me now. Take Mark, John Mark, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry's sake. Listen, I don't care how bad you've run up to this point. Finish well. It's not who starts the race the fastest or runs the swiftest in the middle of the course. It's they that endure to the end. John Mark may have flaked out in the early parts of his maturing as a minister of the gospel. But as Barnabas comes alongside of him and encourages him and strengthens him and looks at this young man in the face and says, you can do this. Don't give up. Yeah, but Paul thinks I'm a failure. You're not a failure. You know, Paul's just focused on the work. And uh, and he's so focused on the work, he doesn't see you, John Mark. And be, be kind to Paul. That's who he is. That's his personality. That's how God made him. That's how he needs to be. But I'm telling you, God's not done with you yet, young man. Get yourself back up. Get back in the saddle. Don't you give up, and I'm not giving up on you. You'll go with me and I will disciple you and I'll teach you how to be a man of God. I'll teach you how to walk with the Lord. And I'll tell you at the end of Paul's life, it was John Mark that was still there. It was John Mark that was faithful. I think he's a lot like Peter. You remember when Peter failed the early part of his ministry when he denied that he even knew the Lord three times? You get to the end of Peter's ministry and what does he say? Don't crucify me the way you crucify the Lord. Crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified like the Lord. Because yeah, I denied him at one point. You know, I'll tell you some of the greatest lessons you'll ever learn are in your failures. And some of the greatest men of God I've ever known, the most committed to the things of the Lord are men that had great failures in the past and have gotten themselves back up and said, Lord, I'll not fail you the second time. I am determined to finish well. Don't let one mistake or one failure of life mark or mar your whole life. You are not measured by that. 
You are never measured by one failure. You're never measured by a couple failures. Listen, what you're going to be measured by when you stand before the Lord is, did you get back up? Did you forget? As Paul would even write, the things that are behind you, and did you press on to the upward calling of Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Now, I'm telling you, both of these men are right this morning. We should be very consecrated, very focused on the work that God has called us to, but also we should be focused on the people around us. So both of them are right. But both of them are wrong. Now you say, how can they both be wrong? Well, it's wrong to be so focused on one thing that you get tunnel vision. When you look at the life of Jesus, you will find no man more well-balanced than Christ. That's why we're called to be like Christ. We're not called to be like Paul. In fact, Paul will even tell you, follow me as I follow Christ. And when I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. Barnabas would tell you the same thing. Any man used of God would tell you the same thing. Don't follow me unless you see Christ in me. And follow that. They both were wrong because they got tunnel vision. And I think the proper perspective of the church should always be this. Truth is like a river, it flows between two banks. I learned that from Stanley Voke, a guy who had graduated from Spurgeon School of Ministry and was part of the uh, South African revival. I once was asking him about this conflict between Armenianism and Calvinism, and Stanley Voke, who's gone to be with the Lord, said to me, hey, listen, son, I was a young minister, he was an old man. At the end of his ministry, I was in the beginning of mine. He said, truth is like a river. It flows between two banks. You need to strive to be balanced in your ministry. God's work is extremely important. And I'm going to tell you, I tend to be more like a Paul. I know that about me. One of the reasons I'm here is because Chuck Smith said, send Mike there, he's stubborn. He doesn't know how to quit. And I don't know how to do that. And I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you, I don't know how to quit. I only know how to get back up and get in the fray of things. When I'm knocked down, I'm focused. I'm a type A. I know what God has called me to do. I know what He's commissioned me to do. And listen, He's going to find me doing it when Jesus comes for me by the grave or by the rapture. Listen, there's no quit in me. But I also know as a type A personality, I can get so focused on the work that I forget about people. And you need other people around you, like Barnabases, that say, hey, hey, Mike, calm down. Feelings. <laughs> Those are real things, man. Oh, well, they need to get on the, no, 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 you just need to calm down. But I'm one of those people that will not bend on the Word of God. I will not bend on salvation by grace through faith. I will not bend on the inerrancy, the, inac- the accuracy, and the absolute inspiration of God's Word. I'm going to teach you Old Testament, New Testament until I build such a foundation underneath you that can never be shaken. That's who I am. And I can get so focused on what God's called me to do. And I'm right in that because He called me to do it like Paul. But I can fail to be a Barnabas. But God brings Barnabases to the body. Big giant teddy bears that love on you. Uh, when, when Pastor Mike has looked at you and said, what were you thinking when you did that, man? You need to repent. Then this guy can say, you know, I know your feelings. <laughs> you know, he didn't mean to be that way. And we got wonderful, like, big old teddy bear Gary. You know, he just comes alongside and says, you know, man, Mike has, Pastor Mike has your best interest at heart. But he's so focused. And I think the truth of it is, is these personalities, when they blend together in a body, make a body of Christ strong. Amen? Both right, both wrong. But what is necessary is that we be like both of them together because then you become like Christ. You'll never find a man more focused to the call of the ministry than Christ. Praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood. agonizing about the cross, but committed. But you'll never find a man more tender who's, who 
ministers to a woman caught in the act of adultery who they want to stone, and he says to her, where are your accusers? I don't accuse you. But now go and sin no more. Somehow the church has to find balance. Oh, there's a necessity for Paul's today, especially in the pulpit, would you agree? Men unwavering, men uncompromising, men who have a good understanding of the work that God's called them to, dedicated and consecrated to it, unbending, uncompromising, unwilling to change course for anybody, not even for themselves. But then you also have to have the Barnabases, don't you? To keep encouraging people, don't give up. Get back up, keep moving forward. You can do it. God's with you. And we need both of those. We need all of that personality in the body of Christ. And we know that at the end of it, and this is the conclusion I want to come to this morning. I'm going to let you out a little early because it's Father's Day, because we're going to honor the fathers. But I want to encourage you to be a balanced person. I really have been, and my wife is helping me work more on the feelings aspect. You know, I'm pretty sure there's a few nights I woke up listening to music she'd play when I go to sleep for my subconscious. Those feelings, you know. <laughs> Nothing but feelings. Because I don't have them. What I have is focus. And I am determined to finish well. And we have people in this church that are Barnabases that are determined that nobody falls to the wayside as we're moving the church in the direction that God wants them to be. Be careful that you don't try to make a Paul a Barnabas or a Barnabas a Paul. Let the Lord do that, amen? But whatever you are, be all that you are to the glory of the Father, amen? And, and listen, uh, don't complain because you're not something. You know, that's why he says, don't let the hand complain that it's not the eye or the arm that it's not the leg. Listen, function in the body of Christ like God made you. Not all of you have to be a bulldog. Amen? Not all of you have to be the bulldog. Uh, so, so, some of you can be the groomer. You know, you wash, the, you, know, you put the bows on the head and you, you know, you, you take care of the boo-boos and some of you need to be that, but together we become the body of Christ, amen? So I look at this passage as we end, and I'll tell you, I've read to a nauseum different people's views of this, and some said, well, Paul was absolutely wrong, and some would say Barnabas was absolutely wrong, and I have a whole different view. I think they were both right, and they were both wrong. But I think somewhere in the middle, as you combine these two men together, you have a balanced, mature, dedicated, focused, loving compassionate, merciful, gracious Christian. And I would say that you take both of those examples and you marry them together and that's what you and I ought to be. Amen? Amen. Well, let's stand. Well, no, no, no. Let's remain seated. Let me get, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's have the fathers stand. Uh, we want to honor you. And there's a reason why I want to have you guys stand. Listen, being a father today is a very difficult task. Have you noticed? Hey, my son is standing. This is his first Father's Day. Yes. How many is this your first Father's Day? How many is this like your 30th Father's Day? <laughs> Grandfather's Day. Hey, listen, we're living in a society today that has diminished fatherhood. Did you know that? I saw a commercial, I'll never buy this particular brand of car because it showed a woman walking out of the house, her husband following her. When they get to the back of the van, the minivan, they lift the door up and uh, there uh, he's trying to figure out how to fold this thing up. Have you ever tried to fold those like stroller things up? I mean, who makes those things? And he's struggling with it and she kind of grabs out of his hand with a disgusted look on her face and like in two seconds folds it up, throws it in the van, shuts the lid, she gets in the driver's seat, he gets in the passenger's seat and they drive away. That's dishonoring to men and to the leadership God's called them to be. As we close our service out this morning, I want to pray for you, you husbands and you fathers because you are called to the most difficult task of bringing spiritual guidance into your home. 
You are called to love your wife and wash her in the water of the word. You're called to bring up your children, not provoke them to anger, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord so that when they grow old, they won't depart. All of that responsibility plus providing for your family, you know, the, the, just the daily sustenance rests on your shoulders. And listen, ladies, can I say this this morning? You have no idea of what your husband these fathers go through, the spiritual warfare, the fear, uh, the having to grovel with faith, and just everything that they struggle with. You have no idea. And that's why I want to conclude our service this morning by praying for them. So let's bow our heads and let's just pray. Father, for every man that's standing this morning, I, I pray that the Spirit of the living God would strengthen them, that you would give to them wisdom and understanding and guidance. That, Father, that they would be men of the Word, men of God, men filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, That they would be leaders in their home, Father, respected by their wives, obeyed by their children, Father. That as they bring the Word of God and that spiritual insight into their homes, Lord, that you would use that to guide these families in the way that they should go. Lord, may we not be drunk with the wine of this world, but may we be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And may we walk in a way that's pleasing to you and, 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 and not so pleasing to the culture that, by the way, I think is incorrect. May they be correct concerning you and not politically correct. Make them men of God, Lord, and make them uh, be appreciated this day. May they be appreciated this day for all that they do. May their wives and their children honor them this day for all that they do for being men that are focused, but also men that have feelings. And may you bless them, we pray. Honor them, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, and all God's wives and kids would say, amen, amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's have the worship team come. Let's close in the last song this morning. Let's see. What are we going to sing? You got a song picked out? Okay. I like this song. This is a song I asked him to sing last week. Instant, almost in season and out. So, Hey, listen. How many know that the Lord loves you this morning? How many knows that, that God's personality, although he's very focused like Paul, he's also a Barnabas, that he doesn't give up on you? How many know that? We're going to sing a song, The Steadfast Love. You know, it takes all of us to make the body of Christ. Amen? Doesn't it? All different personalities. All different. Hey, listen, I look around, and I will tell you, only God could put this group of people together. Okay? You wouldn't even hang out with each other if it wasn't for the Lord, because there's so much diversity here, it's unreal. Amen? Amen? But we are brothers and we are sisters in Christ and we are committed to the Lord and we are committed to one another. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and, and we'll cut each other some slack. Right? What is that? Okay. Mike is harping again on his harp. Amen, brother. Let's sing this song and we'll close. I love this song. Steadfast love. steadfast love, your steadfast love, your steadfast love overcomes. When troubles rise, you lift our eyes, your steadfast love overcomes. We will rise up singing. Everlasting promise, you will never leave us. We will rise and sing. We will rise believing you, God. Your steadfast love, your steadfast love, your steadfast.
steadfast love, your steadfast love overflows. When troubles rise, your grace does not run dry, your steadfast love overflows. We will rise up singing, we will rise believing, your everlasting promise, you will never leave us, we will rise and sing, we will rise believing, you God, your love won't fail, your love won't fail, it lifts me when I fall, your love pre- you're faithful through it all, your word declares, everything you are, our faithful God, your love won't fail, your love won't fail, it lifts me when I fall, your love prevails, you're faithful through it all, your word Our faithful God, we lift our hands up singing, we lift our hands believing, your everlasting promise, you will never leave us, we lift our hands and sing, we lift our hands believing, you God, we lift our hands. We lift our hands up singing, we lift our hands believing, your everlasting promise, you will never leave us. We lift our hands and sing, we lift our hands believing, you God. Your steadfast love overcomes, your steadfast love. Your steadfast love, your steadfast love overcomes. When troubles rise, you lift our eyes. Your steadfast love overcomes. Yes. You know, Lord, as we conclude our service, the answer to the conflict between Paul and Barnabas. It's always love. Because your word says that love covers a multitude of personal offenses. That's what that word sin means there in the Old Testament, personal offenses. Because you can't be mad at somebody you love. You can disagree, but you'll fix it. And so, Father, may we not just love you. That's the first commandment. But the second is that we love one another. And love is a commitment. It's not a feeling. Just like our love causes us to be committed to you, it teaches us to be committed to one another. And help us, Lord, to be just that committed to each other. Hey, you know what? We're all messed up, and we're all different personalities. And Lord, you call us all together to make us this body. And man, it's interesting. But Lord, we thank you that you called us together to be this body of believers. And of all the churches I've ever pastored and all the churches I've ever ministered in, Lord, I would have to say this is probably the most loving church I've ever been associated with. And I thank you for that. That's your work, not ours continue to cause us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your of you father our lord and savior we pray in the mighty name of jesus amen amen god bless you hey listen if you need prayer we'll be right up here to pray with you and for you if not you are dismissed to take dad out to a wonderful lunch on father's day